Okay, good morning. Can you hear me well? Um, all right, so um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, there's uh, just as a way of warming up, I, I want to um, discuss a few of the general lessons that we learned uh, from the example we did yesterday <clears throat> of um, integrating out a heavy particle at tree level. Um, and then we will uh, start to get into some of the technical tools we need to talk about loops. Um, and uh, we'll see how far we get today as far as actually doing some loop level uh, examples. Um, so um, today's slogan uh, is, um, is something that uh, my collaborator, uh, Marcus Ludi, uh, likes to say um, essentially on a, on a sort of daily basis or meeting basis, which is that um, EFT is smarter than you are. Okay, uh, it's, uh, and, and what he means when he says this is that if you're encountering something confusing, um, it's very likely that you're making a mistake, that you're misinterpreting something about the EFT and its properties uh, not that the EFT itself is having a problem, okay? And so, the, really, the, the idea here is the rules are very simple, and if you follow them, then uh, everything is supposed to just work. And it may be that you, again, like we've discussed a little bit um, in the discussion and, and yesterday, you know, maybe that you... That you don't have the right degrees of freedom, or you may be missing an interaction, or you know, very likely, certainly in my case, you might be missing a minus sign or a factor of two. Uh, but nonetheless, if you always just remind yourself that the effective field theory is um, is actually very smart and robust, then um, you'll you'll probably dig yourself out of whatever hole you're in. Okay. So, what are some examples of uh, the intelligence of EFT? Well, you can really, um, I think one example where uh, the ideas we've been discussing really shines in a phenomenological context uh, relates to the other lectures you're hearing this week, okay? So if we just take the standard model and we extend it by higher dimension operators, Then at dimension five, we can write a new contribution to L effective, which schematically takes the form one over M LH squared, where this is the lepton doublet, this is the Higgs doublet, right? And when the Higgs gets a FEV, this gives us Majorana neutrino masses, where we have a reason for them to be parametrically smaller than the weak scale, right? Namely, the seesaw mechanism when you actually go and build a model that gives you this in the UV. But from an EFT point of view, um, this is, you know, at some level expected just because of the charges and the structure of the standard model, right? Um, so I think this is a this is you know a very compelling example, and it was one of the first examples. You know, Weinberg wrote. Uh, very nice paper pointing this out, um, and uh, and it explains the smallness of neutrino masses, um, or provides a, a, at least an explanation. Okay, and there's another aspect of the standard model that sort of that that's accidental, which again we can understand in terms of effective field theory, uh, which is namely that uh, again in the standard model. Baryon and lepton number um, 
our accidental symmetries of the standard model Lagrangian uh, up to dimension four. Right, so again, we can add higher dimension operators to the standard model, um, which give us things like proton decay. And again, we can understand the stability of the proton or the, the metastability of the proton um, as a consequence of just, again, the standard model charges and the allowed operators you're, you can write down, and the fact that once you go beyond dimension four, you're suppressed by heavy mass scales, right? So in this case, again, we can UV complete these operators into grand unified theories and so on, and that's um, an enormous subject, but, um, but nonetheless, this, this is, uh, provides us with explanations, right? Reasons um, for seeing these kind of strange features uh, of the standard model. So, the general lesson from the exercise we did yesterday is how do I interpret the various interactions, okay? So, if I want to interpret um, irrelevant interactions, for example, I have L effective has some coupling with some normalization to get symmetry factors to be simple. Um, and this lambda six has mass dimension minus two, right? It's, this is a, an operator suppressed by uh, m squared. And so if we assume that we have simple UV completions, okay, or at least that the next level of the theory is at some scale m, where everything's roughly degenerate, um, and the couplings are order one, um, then we expect lambda six to be uh, to the minus one half power to be of order capital M, okay? And indeed, in our example, we saw this rule of thumb play out we had lambda six is g squared 45 lambda prime minus 60 lambda over m eta to the fourth minus, right? We had this Gori expression. The details are not important. Um, what mattered is that when all the couplings are order one, all the dimensionful couplings are order m, sure enough, this goes like one over m squared, okay, when we take that generic expectation. Um, but one thing to notice, and this is very important, is that when we're interpreting these interactions, okay, this lambda six, even though we say it's of order one over m squared, there's a bunch of coupling constants involved here, okay? And so, at some level, if you uh, assume that your UV theory is perturbative, that your couplings are, you know, sort of order four pi or less, then there's a lower bound on the mass scale, okay? But it's just worth keeping in mind that it's always some combination like this, okay? It's UV completion dependent, but it's always some combination like this that's appearing secretly in that coefficient of your effective operator. Um, so it's possible to have small couplings in the UV, um, in which case this lambda six to the minus one half could be much, much bigger than m eta, okay? So, we associate a mass scale with these higher dimension operators, they definitely tell us, their presence tells us that there is some deeper UV scale in the theory, okay, in the, in the UV completion, but 
it doesn't one-to-one -one give us the mass, okay? So this is an important takeaway of the examples from yesterday. And you could ask, can we go in the opposite limit? And as you probably know, um, if we take the couplings to be large, well, then we hit a breakdown of perturbation theory. And that in and of, in, in and of itself is not necessarily a problem. It just, it just means that we can't calculate, right? So when we did this perturbative matching, we did it at tree level, that assumes that the expansion, the loop expansion is useful, right? And another way of uh, thinking about the breakdown of perturbation theory is that we're, we haven't organized the theory in terms of the right degrees of freedom, right? And this is very familiar from QCD, where at high energies we have quarks and gluons, at low energies we have mesons and baryons, and um, and so the you know and that's crossing a non-perturbative threshold where we don't know how to actually do that matching. Nonetheless, we believe that in principle nature is matching, say, the theory of QCD onto the Carroll Lagrangian, right? And so um, and there are non-perturbative uh, symmetries that we can use to at least. Uh, um, match to some degree the properties of the UV and the IR there. But we can't do this kind of calculation, right, where we get this exact mapping from, you know, QCD couplings and masses to uh, the terms that appear in the Carl Lagrangian, right? Um, so this can be formalized. You can actually um, investigate the scale where perturbation theory breaks down or the size of a coupling for which perturbation theory breaks down, using the tool of um, partial wave unitarity. So for example, uh, we're not gonna do the details here, um, but you know the idea is you can express your amplitude in a, in a uh, discrete basis of partial waves. And then, once you have that discrete basis, you can enforce that none of the partial waves is ever bigger than one in the right units, okay? Um, that's essentially a, a, a formulation of the conservation of probability. You derive this from the fact that the S matrix is bounded, okay? And when you do that, you can compute concrete bounds on say, the scale here. So when you have these higher dimension operators, you expect growth with energy of your amplitudes, right? Because we're doing an expansion in E over M. And what this kind of calculation is telling you, basically, is when is that E over M expansion breaking down? As I crank up the energy, eventually, that is no longer going to be a small parameter. My power counting stops working, OK? and um, and so, for example, in this simple theory with uh, just a phi to the sixth term, um, using the tools of partial wave unitarity, you can derive that uh, M has to be less than or equal to about 100 lambda six to the minus one half, okay? So you can interpret this, if you like, as a bound on the size of the couplings that are allowed. But, you know, be careful here. These bounds uh, are um, necessary conditions, but they're not necessarily sufficient conditions, okay? Um, and so, you know, you always have to satisfy the bounds for each partial wave, but um, in principle, there could be stronger bounds, okay? Um, and so this, at some level, gives us uh, an upper bound uh, on the new physics scale. Okay. Um, good. There's one other uh, topic here that I'm not going to have time to go into. By the way, this is an example of EFT being smart, right? So the EFT knows when it breaks down. If you know how to ask the right question, then you can see um, from the bottom up with no 
assumption about the UV, except the power, the, the implicit assumption in power counting, uh, then you can see the validity of the EFT just strictly from the, from the bottom up. Um, yeah, oh, please. Oh, you mean where does this come from? Yeah, so um, the uh, basically you just, so in this case, um, you would compute the two to four scattering amplitude, you expand it in partial waves, and then you enforce that those partial waves are, are smaller than one. The details aren't really important. There's some factors of uh, pi and two and stuff that you have to get right. Um, but you could basically just enforce that each partial wave is um, is smaller than one in the right units, and that gives you uh, something that looks like you know number times e squared over m squared is less than one, and so then you can solve for the energy where the theory breaks down, right? And so um, so that's the, that's the basic strategy there. Um, yeah, uh, if you want, I can. Um, we could talk about it more, more in more detail on Thursday. I didn't write up the calculation, but I, I have it. Uh, uh, I could bring it then. Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, not. It's it's very process dependent. Yeah. So in, indeed, you need to do this calculation sort of for every amplitude, and for SMEFT, it's very complicated. Um, there's a. Uh, well, since you since you asked, actually, um, the interpretation of this for SMEFT is also um, something where I think there's okay. Not to digress about this too much, but this is something um, that that's I think an open research question, something I've worked on and that I'm still working on. Um, but the uh, these bounds are um, are in principle bounds. So this is saying. If I want to be able to do any experiment with the EFT, okay, then um, I formally must satisfy this bound for the EFT to be valid for any prediction I would want to make. Okay? But at the LHC, it's much more complicated. The, um, so there's an issue, which is that often when we go at the LHC and we look for the indirect effects of new physics using SMEFT, we find that the bounds on the Wilson coefficients we get are in the ballpark of you know, 500 GeV, less than a TeV. And that's because we have uh, limited data, there's limited statistics, and so the sensitivity is not uh, as powerful as you might like, okay? So this, imply, this kind of uh, argument implies a very important question, which is when we use a SMEFT operator and we get a bound from data that's one TeV, say, but we're colliding protons at over 13 TeV, is, the, is, is what we're doing nonsense, right? Because in principle, partial wave unitarity would tell you that uh, the theory, the EFT is completely invalid, that you shouldn't be using it, okay? Um, but I think that that is an over-interpretation of these bounds, because at the LHC, we're always, you, since we're colliding protons, right, we always have an ensemble of collision energies, right? That's what the PDFs, we can compute that with the PDFs. And, um, and so my collaborators and I have uh, proposed a little formalism where you basically dress these calculations of, for partial wave unitarity using PDFs, and you find that actually these bounds depend uh, very sensitively on the search you're doing. So the more inclusive your search, the lower this bound becomes, and in fact, it could very well be that many of the searches uh, for SMEF being done at the LHC are completely fine, even though they're getting these low scales, okay? Um, but I think this is something to be, uh, for those of you interested in SMEF, this is something really to be um, worried about. Say, if you're doing global fits in SMEF, and you've got all these different measurements with all these different scales in them, um, you know, you, you you should wonder if um, if the EFT is actually valid, right? Basically, and what that really means, what does it mean for the EFT not to be valid? What it means is that the prediction for whatever shape you're getting from the EFT, 
could never be reproduced by any perturbative UV completion. Okay, that's what this test is really about. It's saying that um, that the the entire space of UV completions would never lead to the the shape that you're getting by using the EFT in the invalid region. Okay, so um, and that's a very strong statement. So we need to be careful um, with these interpretations, especially at the LHC. Okay, um, so anyway, that's a uh, Again, that's something uh, maybe we could discuss uh, tomorrow evening in the discussion session if, if somebody wants to bring it up, but um, uh, I can pull up that paper and walk you through that derivation. Um, anyway, so, um, and, and let me just emphasize in, in that spirit, right? On day one, I said, the first thing when you want to d define an EFT, the first question you have to ask yourself is, what physical process am I trying to describe, okay? These calculations are idealized for, say, collision of fundamental particles, like E plus E minus collisions, where you have exactly the same center of mass energy with every event. And so in that case, you really do know what E is, right? And you can uh, use these kinds of arguments to come up with a bound on the scale. But um, if you're doing a more inclusive search at the LHC, now you have to rethink those assumptions and you need to use the EFT, or you can interpret the EFT for the specific uh, experimental observable you're interested in, okay? So even though we're, we're, we've been pretty theoretical in these lectures and we're gonna get even worse when we get into loops, right? Always keep in mind at the end of the day, the point is to try to describe an experiment systematically, okay? And so um, I think that's a, that's a really important thing to, to keep in mind with interpreting this, okay? Great. Um, oh. Um, well, if you if you introduced BSM particles with renormalizable couplings, then um, what's it written up here? I mean, then basically, you know, the rule of thumb would just be that you keep the couplings lower than four pi. Although if you really wanted to come up with the right factors of two there, you would use the same kind of arguments. Um, if you, anytime you have these higher dimension operators, then there's some bound on a scale, right? So it just depends on what couplings, what couplings you would introduce. I see, I didn't know that history. I see. Yeah, um, I guess, uh, yeah, I was unfamiliar maybe with, uh, with the complications of the, of the story there, indeed. But um, to me, I think the, at least um, the, the modern point of view that we, uh, that we should just, um, that there's, a, there's this conceptual difference between the operators up to dimension four and the ones beyond dimension four. I think that's really the lesson here, right? And then, of course, however we choose to UV complete these models motivates uh, studying the effect, these indirect effects, or you know, in the case of neutrino mass, it's a very direct effect. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think the seeing it from the bottom up and from these top down models, I think, is is extremely important because um, it guides, yeah, uh, it definitely guides the way we think about it. Exactly. Exactly. Great. Any other uh, comments or questions about this? Um, okay, um, there's one other um, uh, 
sort of a constraint, low energy constraint on the properties of higher dimension operators that uh, we're not going to have time to go into, but I just want to mention um, and um, just so you have some awareness of it. And again, it's an example of um, remarkable way, a, a remarkable way in which the effective field theory is, is uh, smarter than you might think it, it would be, which is what are called positivity bounds. And um, essentially, there are classes of higher dimension operators um, where you can uh, derive that the coefficients of those operators must be positive in order to respect, uh, say, the causal properties of the low energy theory. Um, so there's a grow ever growing literature on this. Um, it's it's a fascinating topic. It it really relies on uh, some deep properties of of QFT amplitudes, um, the analytic structure. Um, but I just am mentioning it quickly here. Um, so uh, for com sort of for completeness, this is another example. So the partial wave unitarity is a bottom-up test of the EFT. This tells you whether or not perturbation theory is working. These positivity bounds are also a bottom-up test of the validity of the EFT. If you're outside the region of positivity, then uh, your EFT doesn't make sense. And again, we believe that that means that no UV completion exists, okay? So even, um, maybe this gets to your comment, you know, even when we're uh, treating EFT from this agnostic point of view, we really, at least, I really care about the, in principle, there being a UV completion, right? We're not just doing EFT uh, for beyond the standard model of physics for the sake of it, right? We're using it as a tool to try to learn about UV physics. And so, um, so you know, respecting things like positivity and, and partial wave unitarity are very important because they inform what's the allowed parameter space um, where we could have UV completions, okay? Um, Good. Okay. Very quickly, I just want to mention uh, the bottom up. Oh, yeah, please. Oh, I didn't explain. I didn't explain it at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I. So we could spend a whole two-hour uh, lecture on this. Um, and uh, you know, Francesco is one of the world's experts on these things. So you should bug him. But um, but yeah, I, I really just I just wanted to to make sure you heard the keyword, and we can. Um, Happy to, to bring it up in the discussion session, uh, but um, yeah, and I can give you references and stuff. Um, okay, uh, and there are some, sorry, uh, we should move on, but there are some even nice applications to SMEFT for uh, some nice recent papers, uh, and um, anyway. By the way, I, I maybe didn't say this explicitly, but you can always send me a message, send me an email. Uh, if you're looking for references, um, it's very easy, you know, uh, I can, be happy to hear from you anytime. It doesn't have to be this week. In the future, if you just ping me and say, hey, you mentioned this thing. Do you have any references? I'd be delighted to, um, to hear from you and to send you whatever. Um, all right, good. So um, that was just a quick aside. Now, I just want to mention, again, the lessons that we learned from, from our example about the relevant and the marginal couplings, OK? Um, and so um, for. Marginal couplings, in this case, because they're dimensionless, they really don't point to um, any new physics scale. Okay, there's in principle logarithmic dependence, but um, as we'll talk about the, the, when we get into loops, the decoupling theorem tells us that um, you know essentially that logarithmic dependence can all be calculated using beta functions at low energies, and so um, so it really doesn't tell us um, anything because like we talked about extensively um, yesterday, this connection to renormalization, right? is that you absorb the unknown UV physics into the definition of the coupling. And so it really, um, it's a blessing and a curse, right? It's a blessing in the sense that we can do anything at low energies. Otherwise, we'd have to know the details of the string theory UV completion to make predictions in QED, and that would be a mess. 
Uh, on the other hand, it, it you know, the, the curse is that it just doesn't tell us anything, right? So if we only have marginal couplings in our theory, then we just don't know whether or not there's another scale, okay? Um, and that's in stark contrast to having these dimension six operators, right, where they point to some scale, albeit dressed by couplings, okay? Um, and then for relevant couplings, here, again, we, we talked about this a bit, but I really want to emphasize, um, so if I had some qubit coupling for this scalar field, then if we use the naive approach, where I have lambda three of order the heavy scale m, then dimensional analysis would tell us that our matrix elements would go like lambda three over E, right? And that's like capital M over E, which is much, much bigger than one if we're at low energies, right? So the whole point of the EFT is we're doing an E over M expansion. So if we took our relevant couplings to be as large as the fundamental scale in the problem, then we would have a non-perturbative theory at low energies, okay? And so the EFT only makes sense if our, all of our couplings with positive mass dimension are of order the small scale, okay? And we'll come back to this uh, a bit tomorrow, um, but I just want to emphasize that the EFT only makes sense if, say, this lambda three is much, much less than capital M, okay? Now, we can enforce this by using a symmetry and treating this parameter as a spurion of symmetry breaking so that in the limit that lambda three goes to zero, a new symmetry emerges and that gives us an explanation or at least a, uh, it makes us feel better about the fact that this coupling is parametrically smaller than we would have guessed by naive dimensional analysis, okay? Um, so lambda three could be a spurion Um, is everybody familiar with that concept, that term? Um, we'll talk about it a little bit more tomorrow too um, when we have our loop examples in front of us. But the point is, you know, in here, for, for example, um, so it could be that um, lambda three goes to zero, we get a Z2 symmetry, phi goes to minus phi, right? So that's, a an example of this um, giving us a quote reason for this parameter to be small. But notice that there's another relevant parameter for the scalar field, which is the mass So this term m squared phi squared is not a spurion of symmetry breaking. And in this simple model with one real scalar field, there is no symmetry we can enforce that would make it a spurion, okay? So this, is, this leads us to the hierarchy problem. And to really understand the hierarchy problem, we're gonna need to go to our loop examples. Okay, so I'm just gonna mention it again and then postpone a long discussion of it um, until tomorrow. But you can see already just at this uh, cartoon level that in, in this simple theory, we do have a reason for, the, for the, this coupling to be small, okay, but not for the mass. So what do we do? Well, in our example so far, we've just enforced that it was small by hand, okay? Um, but we'll spend uh, some time tomorrow talking about how we can promote this mass to a spurion of some kind of symmetry breaking. Um, 
okay? And, um, yeah. So, that's pretty much the, the full story for how to think about the, the theory from the bottom up. Um, and the constraints you need on um, on the parameter space, okay, in order for the theory to be a sensible EFT. Um, and so the last thing I want to say before we uh, spend quite a bit of time just developing some technology, some theoretical technology, is that um, what we have now is we have an expanded perturbation theory, okay? So I said this yesterday, but it's worth emphasizing again because we're gonna at least touch on it a little bit in, in the way we do loops. So So now we have a loop expansion, which you can think of as being an expansion in terms of h bar. And we also have our power counting expansion, so at tree level, it's clear that these are just two different axes, okay? Um, so they're, they're distinguished. At tree level. And in fact, you can go, if you fix your order in the power counting expansion and you only include loops that involve the marginal and relevant couplings, then you can basically do higher and higher loop calculations um, without encountering any subtleties, you just use the standard rules from, um, that you learned in your QFT course. So for example, people compute the anomalous dimensions for the SMEFT operators. Okay, there are some uh, very famous papers doing this. Um, and what they do is they just compute loop corrections using the standard model couplings and, um, and they get some renormalization group evolution equations for all the operators in SMEF. It's this big matrix and it has all kinds of interesting structures. Um, but as soon as you start going to higher orders in the power counting expansion, then you see that there's a, a very subtle interplay between the renormalization properties of the EFT and the order you go to in the loop expansion. And basically, you get um, interplay between operators of higher dimension and lower dimension you have to be careful uh, with how you renormalize. Um, so I I'm not sure we'll get into that too much. I just want to say it here, um, and then you know we'll kind of see where where things take us. Of course, in the discussion, that'd be a great thing we could talk about is is how um, how to do that systematically. Okay, it's just something something to be aware of, and and it's also it can be confusing when you go into the literature. You know, pay close attention to when they're doing the loop expansion, which couplings are they involving in the loops, okay? If they're only including one factor of an EFT operator, like, like in the SMEFT example I mentioned, um, then you know, they, you'll see people will compute two loop and so on, uh, anomalous dimensions, and that's, that's what they're doing, okay? That's why they're, they're, they're just dressing with factors of standard model couplings, okay? Right, good. Any, que any questions or comments about this big picture stuff? Um, yeah, that's, that's a great way of um, understanding in a deeper way what this Burian is doing, but um, but I think it's completely equivalent to just saying that when you set the parameter to zero, uh, you get an enhanced symmetry, right? And so, um, but that's a way, the, the nice thing about doing that is, in this Z2 case, it's very trivial, 
right? So you don't need to be fancy. But when you, if you're studying, say, chiral perturbation theory, where you have um, these, you know, say, U3 symmetry group, U3 left and U3 right, your spurion breaks it in a very special way. And so doing what you said, promoting it to a field, allows you to write down the terms that are consistent with the symmetry. And then, if, and then when you set that to some constant value, it gives you exactly the right structure. And, um, and so, uh, so it's important that it, you know, you break this, you incorporate the symmetry breaking in a way, in the way that it really is consistent with the symmetries that it's breaking. And that's the trick to, to being able to do that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Ah, because, um, so uh, I should say, I'm assuming, for example, let's say I have, um, call it lambda four, phi to the fourth, where this is an order one coupling, okay? So, so let's imagine I'm working in this theory. Then when I set m squared to zero, no new symmetry emerges, right? Because there's, it's a real scalar field, so I really only have the options of, um, of using this kind of Z2-like structure. Now, one example you may be familiar with is, even for a real scalar field, there is one type of symmetry I can use to forbid a mass, which is a shift symmetry. But that's why I say I have this big coupling, because this violates that shift symmetry at an order one level. So we'll talk, when we talk about this more tomorrow, the, if you want to use a shift symmetry in order to solve the hierarchy problem by making this field a, um, or, or making this parameter a spurion of shift symmetry breaking, then um, you have to immediately face the fact that the Higgs has a non-trivial potential. And so it, it becomes quite complicated to build a realistic model that gives you the right phenomenology while also um, respecting the shift symmetry to a, enough of a degree that it helps solve this problem, right? Um, so at least, again, in the application to the Higgs, this is kind of, this, this shows you the tension. The other, of course, the other very famous and the only other known field theoretic way to solve this problem is using supersymmetry. And, but supersymmetry re requires us to introduce more degrees of freedom. And so again, just in this simple theory, we can't, um, there's no symmetry that we can enforce. Um, we have to either do something funny with the cortic or we have to um, introduce supersymmetry in order to, yeah. Um, by the way, the, uh, there was something I knew I forgot. This, this story here, just again, so you're familiar with the terminology, um, often goes by the name Tuft naturalness. Okay, because he was the first to articulate this idea, you know, the, it was understood pretty early that there was, um, that there was an issue with scalar masses and quantum corrections, um, but the, so you'll, you'll sometimes see people will talk about an idea um, attributed to Wilson, so you'll hear about Wilsonian naturalness, and that's what we've really been talking about here, which is the idea that um, all couplings with mass dimension are set by the fundamental scale, and all Dimensionless couplings are order one. So that, that's usually, that, that philosophy is usually attributed to Wilson. Again, Wilson was, is really the, the father of EFT and, and as he was discovering these ideas, you know, he was realizing the kinds of things that we're, we've been discussing. And so, um, so the idea of a typical parameter space in a theory is, is attributed to Wilson. But to Hooft gave us this more refined notion by introducing um, the, idea that you could explain the smallness of parameters um, if, they, if you could understand that they were spurions, okay? So you might hear those two uh, names for, for these ideas um, as, you, as you read or explore, and, and so that's what it's referring to, okay? Um, I would say this is, the, this is sort of the modern philosophy. This is the way we think about naturalness, okay? Cool. So, um, Next, I want to uh, switch gears and I want to spend, we'll see, it may take us the rest of our time today um, on um, basically developing uh, the technology we need for doing loop calculations. Um, and I expect that, 
a lot of this may be familiar to you, but um, there's a few little details that, that are important to get the factors of two right that I want to highlight. So hopefully, even if you are familiar with this, maybe there'll be something new, or at least I'll remind you of some important uh, details. Um, but nonetheless, I think it's worth doing going through these derivations together because um, not everybody has, you know, computed a loop in recent in recent memory. So, um, so the first thing I want to talk about is um, dimensional regularization. So, and we're going to almost exclusively use dimensional regularization uh, for our time together here. That's because it is the central tool of modern EFT. And um, the, I'll, I'll, when, as we develop it, I'll, I'll make a big deal out of some of its properties that, that explain why it's so useful um, for EFT calculations. Nonetheless, it's easy to get confused. So the, you know, the types of, basically the, the problem with dimensional regularization is that it hides, it sets certain divergences to zero automatically. So for example, when you have quadratically divergent integrals, um, the, the quadratically divergent contribution that you would see if you had a, a cutoff is just absent in dimensional regularization. And one of the, one of the maybe most important lessons I want to um, leave you with when we get, as we get into loops is that effective field theory, the combination of dimensional regularization and effective field theory can expose those quadratic divergences in a, in a physical way, okay? And that will, um, we'll see that in an example. And so, um, so I hope to dispel, if you've heard um, things said incorrectly about dimensional regularization, for example, sometimes people say, oh, there's no hierarchy problem if you use dimensional regularization, um, and that's just wrong. Um, and uh, and I hope to convince you of my my goal is to show you why that's wrong and where they're making that mistake. Okay, um, but it's again I, I'm assuming, and you can always of course slow me down. We can uh, we can introduce some cutoffs into our calculations if we need to if if you're confused. But I'm assuming that you've sort of seen the structure of loops, the idea of you know naive the the naive approach to determining the degree of divergence. Um, and so on, uh, and a lot of that's obscured with dimensional regularization. So I just want to um, make sure that's clear. Then, um, so the first thing is we're going to follow uh, the typical definition in the EFT literature. So we'll take space-time dimension, we'll extend it beyond four, and I'm going to use um, a shift four minus two epsilon, okay? Um, so there's some factors of two here that are maybe different from um, what you might have seen. The reason is that when you do it this way, the combination that always appears is one over epsilon plus log of mu squared over m squared. And so it's, it's just a factor of two. This factor of two difference is whether or not you square the parameters inside of here. Um, and so, anyway, this is, uh, this is the convention we're going to use. And, um, but I just want to, I think it's worth really emphasizing, if you compare maybe the calculations you've done without the two, you may have factors of two different. Of course, these factors of two don't matter um, at the end of the day. But when you're doing calculations, you might, you might get confused. So the other convention is, um, D equals four minus epsilon, which gives one over epsilon plus log mu over m. The, um, but in either case, right, there's this uh, point, which we take advantage of when we're computing renormalization group evolutions, which is that we can track the log dependence by simply tracking the one over epsilon dependence, right? And it's just easier to calculate these one over epsilons, right? It's almost trivial to extract them, especially at one loop. Um, and so if we're interested in resumming logarithms, 
right? We can basically compute the coefficients of the log by computing the coefficient of one over epsilon, right? They always come together. And that, um, that underlies the technology that we, um, that we develop in QFT courses. Um, okay, so when we change space-time dimension, we need to be careful about our dimensional analysis because all of our dimensional analysis was predicated on the idea of being in four dimensions. So let's revisit um, the dimensional analysis. So we have um, the action is always dimensionless in natural units, okay? That's the starting point. So we go from the action defined like this, say for our scalar field, um, and now we promote it to D dimensions. And so since the action's dimensionless and the derivative also is, uh, its mass dimension is independent of space-time dimension, right? Um, then uh, we can determine the dimension of the fields. So um, we have D, uh, sorry, we have D mu phi squared dimension altogether has to be four minus two epsilon, right? Because we need this combination to be dimensionless and D is four minus two epsilon. And then the fact that partial mu has fixed mass dimension tells us that the dimension of phi is one minus epsilon. Okay? And this is important because it tells us that when we analytically continue the theory to D dimensions, we need to introduce some kind of dimensionful parameter to make everything self-consistent. And so this is one way of understanding why this dimensional regularization scale mu appears in, um, in the game. So our Lagrangian includes, say, C4. Okay. Sorry, now I've, I've changed notation. Let me, I'm going to use C here for the, for the Wilson coefficient. Um, okay, so if I have, Lagrangian has this structure in D dimensions. Now I, by convention, I choose to leave this C4 dimensionless. Okay, that's convenient for our purposes. But then I need to soak up the mass dimension of, so phi, right, changed by this amount epsilon, and so in order for dimensional analysis to stay consistent, I need to soak up the change in the dimension with this factor of mu to the two epsilon, okay? Um, so that keeps my Lagrangian uh, so that all the terms have the same mass dimension of the Lagrangian, okay? And for phi to the sixth, there's the same type of argument gives me mu to the four epsilon phi to the sixth, okay? And these are important factors of two that are gonna appear later, um, okay? So, um, The, the next step is going to be, we're going to want to renormalize, okay? So we're going to want to use the, uh, the tricks of counterterms and so on. And, um, and so we're going to introduce um, the idea of bare parameters and renormalized parameters um, 
So we have C0, the zero is, is for the bear, and I'll be careful about this for a little while um, as we set things up. And then that is equal to some factor Z, which is the renormalization factor. This will include the counter term mu to the n epsilon C R, okay, where the R is the renormalized. And this n, as you see, right, it depends on which operator we're renormalizing, okay? So we need to be careful to use dimensional analysis to determine the factors of mu that appear in front here, okay? So this depends on operator dimension. Okay. And then, for convenience, because we're always going to get these annoying factors of um, Euler gammas and 4 pi, log 4 pi, we define a different version of mu, because mu is just some arbitrary parameter. Um, so we will introduce uh, what we'll call mu tilde squared, and that's going to be mu squared times 4 pi e to the minus Euler gamma. Um, and this is the MS bar scale. Okay? And so we're going to use MS bar scheme, which means we uh, send mu to mu tilde and counter terms subtract the coefficient, whatever number, times 1 over epsilon we find, okay? And what this amounts to is when we do calculations, we can simply compute the coefficient of 1 over epsilon, okay? And that gives us the coefficient that's in front of the log, like I said before. And the log will be defined in terms of this mu tilde. It's, again, it's just because you always get the same factors and they don't change the physics, um, we essentially, by doing this, we're just dropping them, okay? Um, and we're allowed to do that because there's this arbitrariness in the, in the choice of counter term. Um, so um, the last thing I want to discuss before we take a break is the interpretation of mu. Because I think, again, this is something where uh, it's easy to get confused. So um, when we when we compute some loop integral and we use a hard cutoff, so we have some integral i. We're going to regulate with a cutoff, and we get something that looks like log lambda, okay? There's, of course, needs to be some other dimensionful quantity here. Um, let me square it since I'm using the, okay, so this is divided by, say, you know, some function of m squared and p squared and whatever uh, other dimensionful quantities appear in my problem. And this we then interpret as being the most fundamental scale in the theory. We absorb it into a counter term. We send it to zero or to infinity at the end, whatever, um, right? But the really the important thing is that we identify the coefficient in front of the log so that we can use um, the tricks of renormalization group evolution to, to resum the series and, and improve perturbation theory. But conceptually, we think of this as being a fundamental scale, deep in the UV, okay? But there's an extra step in this procedure, which, again, depending on um, how this was explained to you, may or may not have, have been emphasized which is when we 
use the renormalization group, we evolve from some from lambda down to um, let me call the scale uh, lambda sub, okay? Where this is what we call a subtraction scale, and it's of order the the typical scales in our problem in the EFT or at low energies, okay? Now, this is not so important if all you're doing is running your couplings because all you care about is the coefficient in front of the log, you compute renormalization group evolution equations, you solve them to run the couplings, you plug in the running coupling value at low energies, and you get some answer and, and that's what you're told to do. But one of the things that we'll see in our examples here when we compute some loop corrections is that this, choosing this subtra subtraction scale to be of order the typical scale of the problem is extremely important because this choice is made to minimize some uh, finite logs that you may have never computed before. Okay, so again, one of the things that we're going to see that the EFT technology does for us is it exactly incorporates the effects of running couplings and the effects of the finite logs in such a way that it explains why you should take the subtraction scale to be small. Okay, so the Again, this step is often uh, skipped in the logic, okay? You're just told, okay, this is how you compute the RG, and then because you never compute the finite terms, you just worry about the divergent terms, um, you may not have seen why you're ev evaluating things at the low scale. What logs are you really minimizing, okay? So I'm gonna show you that explicitly in, in some examples. The difference with dimensional regularization is that there's no UV uh, or dimensionful UV regulator and mu is automatically a subtraction scale. So one of the benefits of DIMRAG from a technical point of view is that it eliminates this intermediate step, okay? What it does is it regulates the integrals by analytically continuing in dimension. We'll, we'll talk about that a bit more in a moment, exactly how it does it when we come back from a coffee break, but I really want to emphasize the interpretation of this mu parameter. This mu is not a UV cutoff. It's not a large scale, okay? It appears for these technical reasons that we just need it in order to correctly enforce dimensional analysis, but it's really supposed to be a typical scale in the EFT, and we interpret it as a subtraction scale, and we use it to minimize the finite logs that appear in the calculations, okay? So, again, um, depending on how, uh, how much experience you have with this, you may have been confused about the connection between these dimensionful UV regulators lambda and the mu that appears in dimensional regularization, okay? So I really wanna emphasize this. I think this is very important uh, to really understand what's going on. And, um, and this idea of, of introducing a subtraction scale is actually critical to the whole program of renormalization group improving uh, our amplitudes and our cross sections, okay? Um, any questions about this? And we can discuss this for a minute, otherwise we can break for coffee. I realize that that usually suppresses questions by offering a break, but. Um, okay, think about it. Bring your questions back from coffee. Let's, let's reconvene at 15 after, um, and, uh, and we'll keep talking about this stuff. So it's good that you uh, had a minute to 
uh, breathe and stretch your legs, because um, now I want to tell you um, one of the most strange and mysterious things about uh, Dimrag. Um, which is this idea that scaleless integrals vanish. So um, the, and this is a, um, we're gonna use this mathematical statement over and over in, um, in the way we think about EFT. Um, basically, the, the point is gonna be that we can isolate the scales of interest, namely the, um, we can separate the UV and the IR by taking advantage of uh, doing a Taylor expansion and then adding back a scaleless piece so that we can take advantage of the tools of DIMREG. And so I, I uh, want to show you what I mean by something scaleless and then um, give you the simplest example that I know of of how to compute this, but then we're going to take it, if you like, you can think of this as an assumption of DIMREG, okay? So DIMREG is defined so that scaleless integrals vanish, okay? Um, so uh, let me introduce a notation that we'll use a lot, which is just DL in parentheses is D to the DL over two pi to the D, okay? And, um, right, because this factor is going to appear in all our loop integrals, so just some shorthand. So now let's take as an example of a scaleless integral, I, which has mu to the two epsilon in front, because there's some couplings here that I'm not writing that would have given me this factor, and then an integral dl, one over l to the fourth, okay? So, using your naive power counting for uh, the degree of divergence, you would say, oh, I have four powers of L in the numerator. I have four powers of L in the denominator. So I would naively expect this as a log divergent integral, right? Um, and, but the remarkable thing is that when using DIMREG, because this is a pure function of the loop momentum. There are no physical scales appearing inside these propagator factors, be it masses or momenta. This is zero in DIMREG. Okay? It's bizarre because it looks, it's divergent, right? Nonetheless, there's a very simple physical reason that this is zero, which is we know when we do this expansion, we're gonna get some one over epsilons, right? They're gonna conspire with the Taylor expansion of this, which is gonna give us epsilon times mu, uh, times log mu to give us log mu's, okay? Now mu is a dimension full quantity, and so, there's no way for this integral to make sense dimensionally because there's nothing in here to compensate the mass dimension you would get from the log mu in order to give you a dimensionally correct formula, okay? So as with all great things in physics, dimensional analysis tells you that this, this is the only option that makes sense, okay? Nonetheless, it's weird, and, and in fact, I'm going to prove this for you, and you'll see that it's even weirder than it might look on the, at, at face value. Um, so does the dimensional analysis argument make sense? Is that, is that clear? Okay. Because I think that's the best way to remember this fact, okay? So let me evaluate this integral. Um, let's loop here. And what I'm going to do is, because we're, we're potentially, we're exploring the properties of a scaleless integral, we think we know what to do with scale full integrals, okay? 
And so um, the I'm going to use a trick, which is just to rewrite this as the sum of two scale full integrals, which I know how to evaluate. Okay, so let's write i as mu to the two epsilon integral dl one over l squared times l squared minus m squared, and then minus mu to the two epsilon integral dl m squared over l to the fourth l squared minus m squared. Okay? Um, so it's a, it's a little bit of algebra, but maybe you can even see in your head, right, that um, if you combine these, right, multiply by l squared over l squared, and you cancel off this factor, right? You get back to where you started. Um, so by the rules of integration, right, this had better be equal to this, okay? I'm allowed to add terms inside the integrand. Now, it's fair to be a little bit skeptical because the rules of integration hold for convergent integrals, okay? And so, in fact, that's why I say you really can think of this as a definition because the manipulations I'm doing here are a bit suspicious and, um, and I'm gonna show you, uh, yeah, well anyway, let me, let me just work it out and then you can see if it, if it makes you uncomfortable or not. So, um, oh, let me say here, okay, now we have an integral, this first integral, which, as I take L to infinity, I've got four powers of L, four powers of L, so this is UV divergent, right? It's log divergent. As I take L to zero, now I have four powers of L in the numerator, but because of M here, I only have two powers of L in the denominator, and so it's convergent in the IR, okay? So this part is UV divergent, This part, take L to infinity, four divided by six, so it's UV convergent. I take L to zero, now I have four, but here I also have four, right? And so it's log divergent in the infrared. So this is IR divergent. Okay? So to evaluate these integrals, um, I'm going to use the standard techniques. So we'll introduce Feynman parameters. Right, which in general we have, or sorry, in the simplest case we have one over AB is the integral from zero to one dx, one over xA minus one minus xB squared. I use that to combine denominators. Then I wick rotate, right? I go to Euclidean space. And then we're not gonna rederive the Dimrig formula, um, but uh, you know what you do is you need to use, you can compute the solid angle in D dimensions, right? You get some set of gamma functions, then you can compute the radial part of the integral in a closed form, and you can look up the formula and any appendix of any QFT textbook. I'm sure you've used it before. Um, I don't think I wrote it explicitly here. Um, so, um, so I'm gonna do all of those steps, okay, up here. It's a good little exercise if, uh, if you wanna make sure you remember all of these tricks. And then what you'll get is the following regulated integrals. So we'll call the first one I uv, it's I over 16 pi squared, one over epsilon uv, plus log mu tilde squared uv over m squared plus one. 
and then plus order epsilon terms. And I, I R is I over 16 pi squared, one over epsilon I R plus log mu tilde I R squared over M squared plus one plus order epsilon. Okay, so now my I total was I U V minus I I R. And so this equals If I take mu i r equal to mu u v, then I just get the difference of the one over epsilons. Okay, and so then if I set epsilon u v equal to epsilon i r, I get i equals zero. Okay. Um, so this is this gives you some intuition for what's happening. Um, and there's two things I want to say. First of all, this weird thing where I have these two different regulators, one that regulates the UV, one that regulates the IR, and they cancel like this, is it may just seem like, you know, this is all math trickery and manipulating divergent integrals and whatever, um, but actually this is very conceptually important, okay? So um, you'll see me more and more start to say um, that, So another slogan is EFT trades IR divergences for UV divergences and this is the first manifestation of that which is because we're going to use DIMRAG we're going to define everything at loop level in terms of dim reg. And we're always going to take scaleless integrals to vanish. We see that in order for scaleless integrals to vanish, there has to be this mapping between the UV and the IR. Okay? So secretly, every time we use this trick, we're doing something that's relating UV and IR divergences to each other. Okay? Yeah, please. That was the next thing I was going to talk about. Yeah, so that's the um, that's where, if you like, you can think of this as a as a derivation. Um, but really, what we've done is um, well. Let me let me um, let me make sure that that point is clear uh, clear to everyone because that was something I really wanted to emphasize. Okay, when um, when we use DIMRAG, in order for this to be convergent in the UV, we want there to be less powers of L in the numerator than the denominator, right? So since we're doing um, four minus two epsilon, that means epsilon needs to be positive to make this slightly less than four, right? So that this converges. In the IR, it's the opposite, right? Here, we need this to be slightly more powers, okay? So this is exactly the, this comment, which is that in that case, if we're using d minus two epsilon, we need epsilon to be negative in order for this to converge. Okay. So, this is justified by analytic continuation. So the, the claim is 
what I have secretly done here is I computed those integrals, one for negative epsilon, one for positive epsilon. And then I took the negative one and I analytically continued into the positive region so that I could set these equal. Okay? So that's why I think it's just as fair to say that scaleless integrals vanish in DIMREG by definition because there's some non-trivial analytic structure that we're taking advantage of here, okay? Even just in this, this completely trivial example in order to make this cancellation happen, okay? Yeah, please. Yeah, I, so it's a great question. I don't know how to evaluate it. There may be, there may be a way, but if you go back to, the, to those calculations, say if you look in Peskin and Schroeder, you know, he, um, they write, basically the, the, the generic form where they give you an answer is something that looks like uh, DL uh, one over L squared minus he uses delta to the n, right? And he puts maybe some factors in the numerator too. There's some general formulas. But this always gives you some delta to the power, you know, I forget it. Depends on n and d, right? Um, and when delta is zero, this just doesn't make any sense. So, um, so there's, in these evaluations, um, I, th I, I think if you go and revisit uh, if you just try to do it concretely, right, you'll, um, you'll get confused. So there may, be, uh, there may be a set of steps that I just have never um, seen to actually evaluate this directly like that. But yeah, this is the only way I know of. Um, yeah, it's a great question. Because again, this is super weird, right? I want to emphasize that it's weird because it's often, it's just, you know, told to you as a fact. Take it, uh, use it, right? But, um, but I think that um, the seeing that what it's really doing is canceling between the UV and the IR in this way is, uh, is, is conceptually important because again, it's gonna, it's gonna let us interpret what we're doing in EFT as swapping IR divergences for UV divergences. And the reason that that's so important conceptually is because the renormalization group, so, so what do we really care about at loop level? At loop level, the new effect is not that there are divergences. That's not the interesting part. The interesting part is that we can sum logarithms, right? And so, um, like it was emphasized yesterday in the discussion session, um, the, one of the key uses of EFT is that you can improve perturbation theory by summing logarithms. And the way we do that systematically is through the renormalization group, like we'll review next. The renormalization group is a property, it's, it's a consequence of UV divergences, okay? So what we really wanna do in effective field theory is we encounter finite logarithms that could be large that are functions of dimensionful parameters, ratios of dimensionful scales. Well, EFT is all about the EFT approximation kicks in, or it works best, when the ratio of scales is small, right? When we have a big separation. So the last example that I'll show you, um, probably on Friday, uh, is where I actually will do a toy model calculation where we get a log of little m over big M, and we can use all the tools we're developing in order to separate that log into two pieces and sum uh, the tower of logarithms that appears between those two scales and restore the convergence of perturbation theory, okay? And so that's really where we're headed is we want to be able to take logs which are purely IR effects. We want to use these tricks to rewrite the problem in terms of EFT so that we can pull those logs apart 
we can view them as UV divergences from the EFT point of view, and we can use the renormalization group in the EFT to sum logarithms systematically. Okay, and that's really um, one of the main features of, of modern EFT is that it does that in a systematic way. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, so, uh, if there are no other questions about that, then let's uh, review the formalism of the renormalization group, and um, and again, I'm. Uh, this is stuff I, I think you probably have seen in, a, in your courses, um, but I'm gonna do this calculation that, that you've likely seen before, including also the dimension six operator, which maybe you haven't. And, um, and again, there's nothing conceptually new, but the factors of two are slightly different, and I wanna show you where those come from. Um, so, put it here. Okay, so, um, so the starting point here is that we want to exploit the fact that the bearer parameters that we define at some UV scale are independent of this renormalization scale mu, okay? Um, and that fact underlies the renormalization group that turning that into an equation gives us the renormalization group equations, okay? So they're gonna have a form um, d, d log of mu tilde squared um, CNR equals gamma and m c m r. And here I'm writing them for the Wilson coefficients in, uh, in this way where I'm introducing these anomalous dimensions. Again, because I'm, this is the way the EFT community tends to do this, um, tends to organize these calculations. But this is nothing but the, the standard formula that, that you're familiar with. I'm also being careful to define things in terms of summing log of the MS bar scale, mu tilde, um, and this is an equation for the renormalized coupling, okay? Um, and um, so first I just wanna remind you why we call this gamma the anomalous dimension. Um, so if gamma is constant, then it has this very nice interpretation. We could just integrate this equation for one coupling, okay, in the simple case. Um, the integral one over CR, DCR is integral gamma D log mu tilde squared. And so, um, so we can just solve this and we get CR at mu high is CR at mu low e to the gamma log mu high tilde squared over mu low tilde squared. And then that's just this ratio to the two gamma uh, CR at mu tilde low. So, gamma tracks the anomalous scaling of the Wilson coefficient, okay? Anomalous meaning beyond tree level, okay? So, um, maybe not the best word, but so be it. Um, the, uh, so it's basically the breaking of scale invariance that's induced by loops, okay? And, um, and so you can think of this as tracking literally the dimensional analysis, right? Because it's rescaling by dimensional parameters, okay? Um, so that's the first thing I wanna emphasize, right? This is the anomalous dimension. 
And another thing, just from the form up there, is that uh, when gamma n m is non-zero for n not equal m, we get what's called operator mixing. Okay, and um, that's again a, a very generic feature of EFT is that um, in the power counting expansion, you can get operator mixing among operators when the dimension of the combination of operators matches. Okay, so if I have a dimension six operator, it can mix with say a dimension four times dimension six operator when I have a dimension eight operator, right, I can get combinations of, um, that's right, dimension six squared. Um, and so the, you'll see, especially when you go beyond leading order, um, this kind of effect can be very important. And you can generate uh, operators that maybe are zero at a high scale um, by renormalization group evolution through this uh, kind of mixing. Um, so if we want to derive um, what do we mean by these gamma and m, um, we can do that using the standard techniques. So the first step is to introduce counter terms. Um, Oh, by the way, something uh, something I can emphasize here. The be be careful when you're reading between different books or different notes. The definition of the renormalization group equations. So here I've defined gamma where I've factored out a factor of c. Okay, um, but if you look, for example, the standard thing done with QED is to define this whole combination as the beta function, okay? And so depending on whether or not you pull out factors of the coupling, you can get very different answers. Of course, you must get the same renormalization group equations, but often when you're checking your work or whatever, right, you're making sure you understand a calculation, you'll just compare, oh, I got this beta function. And, um, and so, Anyway, I've gotten tripped up by this many times. You look in a reference, you're not, you're doing it quick and you're like, crap, I don't have the right thing, okay? So this can both change coupling dimension dependence and factors of two, okay? That's just uh, an annoyance. There's also uh, something you're probably more familiar with, which is, you know, again, for QED say, you can define the running of the coupling in terms of E of the, of the coupling that appears in the covariant derivative or in terms of alpha, and again, just using the chain rule, right? That introduces factors of two differences. Um, so these are all just little things that can trip you up um, as you're reading between different references. Um, okay, so um, we are going to assume in perturbation theory, we have uh, these Z factors that were introduced to go from the bare couplings to the renormalized couplings um, are one plus something that's order um, the renormalized couplings. Okay, so here I'm introducing some generic, these are say the Wilson coefficients and these are maybe some gauge couplings or whatever, right? But just the point being that it's some function of all the couplings in the theory, okay? Um, but the bare Lagrangian Um, must be mu independent and so we can enforce that as a differential equation. We say zero is mu tilde d d mu tilde c zero and that equals mu tilde d d mu tilde z mu tilde to the n epsilon c r Okay, so this, in terms of the renormalized couplings, this is the um, expression we're gonna use to derive renormalization group equations. Okay, so um, we can start 
by just looking at this at tree level. And at tree level, there's one source of mu dependence that appears, which is namely this rescaling that we needed to do by dimensional analysis. So at tree level, z is one, okay? So we can relate the mu dependence of the renormalized coupling to the mu dependence that appears here, okay? So it's, it's sort of a trivial statement, um, but it's important. So um, I wanna do this by way of an example. So let's take uh, Lagrangian to have a chordic coupling, phi to the four, and a sextic coupling, and I'll factor out some dimensionful parameter here, so that the C's are dimensionless. And then tree level, I find that zero is mu tilde one over Z four, D Z four D mu tilde, plus one over C four R, dc 4 r d mu tilde plus 1 over mu tilde to the 2 epsilon, 2 epsilon mu tilde to the 2 epsilon minus 1, all times z4, c4r mu tilde to the 2 epsilon. Okay, so I pulled an overall factor out Notice I set this, if you look earlier, if you're taking notes, if, if you look earlier, right, this is the choice that's relevant for the chordic coupling. Um, but all I've done is just evaluate that using the product rule, okay? And, um, and now we use the fact that this is zero, right? Because at tree level, Z4 is just one, it's the constant, and this is one, okay? So I can relate the two terms. I get dc4r d log mu tilde squared is minus epsilon c4r. Okay, so I call this gamma 4, 4 classical, or tree level, is just minus epsilon. What is this, the interpretation of this is that when I go to D dimensions, I have an anomalous dimension, right? Because the dimensional analysis changes, okay? So indeed, that's what, that's what we find here, okay? So that's the interpretation. Um, and you can do the same thing for the dimension six operator Um, and so similarly, we get gamma classical six, six is minus two epsilon, where the only difference is that the, um, the epsilon dependence uh, excuse me, the mu dependence for the dimension six operator was mu to the four epsilon. So then if you turn the same crank, you, you get a factor of two here, okay? Okay. So now at one loop, we get, um, the following contributions to Z4 so we get the familiar diagram um, and we get perhaps a less familiar diagram 
okay, which both contribute at one loop order to the uh, five to the fourth operator. Okay, so now in order to, so I'm, I'm not gonna compute these with all of the factors of two at the moment. What I wanna do is I'm just showing you that there's a source of C4 dependence and C6 dependence, right? And now I wanna run the same calculation now assuming this, okay? And I'm gonna derive a generic um, RGE including operator mixing, okay? So you'll see exactly um, how that appears. And So now um, I have zero is d, d log mu tilde squared, z4 of c4r, c6r, mu tilde to the two epsilon, c4r, and I get one half dz4, dc4r, mu tilde over, C4, DC4R, D mu tilde, DZ6, DC6R, mu tilde over Z4, DC6R, D mu tilde, plus mu tilde over C4R, D C4R, D mu tilde, plus two epsilon Z4, Okay, um, so now I truncate these Z4s that appear here to just be one because at this order in perturbation theory, um, the subleading term you get from this is not gonna contribute, okay? because we're only including the first order correction here. So I can set this to one, and I can set this to one. If I went to two loops, right, or higher order, I would have to include that too. Um, and I also plug in these leading order solutions for the anomalous dimensions, okay? So I have this dc4 d log mu squared, right, here I have dc4 d log mu, here I have dc6 d, well, log mu when I write absorb uh, the mu dependence here, I can rewrite these, um, and I can use the answers I got at tree level, right, because I'm doing this iteratively, and um, and the point that I'm trying to emphasize here, besides just reminding you that there's nothing fancy, it's just doing perturbation theory and some calculus, is that that two, right, this two versus that epsilon comes in and actually matters. So if you wanna get the right answer, you have to be careful about the dimensional analysis, right? And at some level, this is where the power counting comes in into the RG is that, you know, this dimension and that dimension are different because they power count differently, okay? And so, um, Putting all of this together, we have dc4r, d log mu tilde squared is epsilon c4r squared dz4 dc4r minus epsilon c4r plus two epsilon c4r c6r dz4 dc6r, okay? So from here we can identify gamma four four is the limit as epsilon goes to zero of epsilon C four R D Z four D C four R minus epsilon. And we have this new feature, which is operator mixing 
which looks like this. Ah, sorry. Okay. So in practice, what we do, right, is we compute these diagrams with all the channels and the symmetry factors, right? And then that gives us the z to, to whatever order and perturbation theory we're working. In this case, it would be to one loop order. And then we just plug that in here or here as you like. And that gives us a differential equation that allows us to sum logarithms, right, through solving this differential equation. And so that's how we leverage uh, the loop calculations, right, the fixed order calculations in order to get these improvements to perturbation theory, right, to get the renormalization group. Um, and so what this does is it reorganizes perturbation theory. So by solving this, the renormalization group equations, we get a double expansion the alpha log expansion uh, versus the alpha expansion. So at one loop, what we're doing is we're summing towers of alpha times log to the n, okay? So it's some series in alpha log. But then if we were to do the two loop RG, which we're not gonna do, um, we would be, we would already include the leading two loop contribution because that goes like alpha squared log squared, but the subleading contribution, which goes like alpha squared log, we have not included, and so that's what you would extract at two loops from the RGE. And in fact, the higher loop RGE looks um, a little bit different, and there's, uh, um, you have to be a little bit careful about um, the fact that what you, what you wanna do is you wanna extract the coefficient of one over epsilon at two loops, even though you have a one over epsilon squared, but the one over epsilon squared tracks the log squared, that's already included when you resum the one loop RGE. And then at two loops, you need to get the subleading coefficient, which is again the coefficient of one over epsilon, okay? So, um, but yeah, that's beyond our scope. We're gonna stick to one loop, okay? Um, but I just wanna, Highlight that, you know, here, and this is often called the N to the NLL expansion leading log, okay? So what we're doing here is leading log summation, right? We're summing the leading log terms. If you went to two loops, then you would be summing the next to leading log, right? The first subleading log, three loops, the next to next to leading log, and so on. Whereas this is called the fixed order, so this is like N to the M um, LO typically. And here, Again, at leading order, that's tree level. Next to leading order is one loop. What you've very likely done in your classes is you've done leading order calculations and leading log summation. And you, I mean, maybe you saw uh, an example of a next to leading order calculation where you actually included or you kept the finite terms, um, but maybe not. And that's what we'll do together tomorrow is we'll start to see I want to show you this interplay between the LL summation or the LL expansion and the LO expansion. And I want to show you how EFT makes this completely systematic, okay, and really um, turns this into just a crank uh, once you have, again, all of the right power counting and degrees of freedom and symmetries, then you just compute. And once you understand the, the way that EFT organizes things, it's in principle quite straightforward to, you know, okay, the integrals are hard, factors two are hard, but, but it's at least straightforward, you know, conceptually to, um, to compute to whatever order you need to go. Um, okay, awesome. Uh, that's a great place to stop. Um, and um, yeah, and, and one thing, by the way, what EFT does for you when I say that is it avoids the double counting, right? Because you clearly should worry that, um, that you're gonna have some logs in here and then in here and how do you separate them and which goes where and all that stuff, EFT is gonna make that um, pretty obvious, okay? So that's, that's really the thing that I wanna show you is how does it organize all of that 
and what does it buy us, okay? Um, so um, good, so let's stop there. Tomorrow we're uh, together in the afternoon and then we have a problem session in the evening. So um, I will see you tomorrow afternoon. All right, thanks. Thank <laughs> you.